Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I am joined by the amazing Casey Tebow. Casey, how you doing today, man? I don't know. If, I don't know if I would say amazing. That could be an overshoot on your part for sure. <laughs> man, I said what I said, and I meant what I said. Oh. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, dude, this is such an honor. Um, anybody that knows me knows I'm a huge fan. Um, but for the people that don't know you, I would like for them to get to know you a little bit here first. Um, you've directed music videos by amazing musicians such yep. as Tech Nine, yep. Aerosmith. You even got a little bit of Surge in there, System yep. Up and Down. Yeah, that's dude. I, I was watching that video the other day, and I'm just like, how fucking badass must this set have been to have Tech Nine and Surge there together? Like, was that something incredible for you to be around these people that are huge icons in the world of music? Yeah, I mean, obviously. Uh, I was a big Tech Nine fan, and System of a Down to me is one of the greatest bands ever. Uh, I yeah. think they're criminally underrated. I think probably because they broke up or whatever. Um, but I got the call to do that, and I was in Hollywood. I think I was doing a live show with like um, Katy Perry or something. And my buddy Sean called me, and he was like, "Will you do this Tech Nine video?" So I put a treatment together. And the thing about working with big artists like that is like you never know what you're running into it's almost like going on a blind date you know it's like yeah. they, they could be super cool or they could just be nightmares to work with i mean luckily i spent a good chunk of my career working with the aerosmith guys and they you know they they deserve to have their moments of not being satisfied with decisions that are being made around them but i wouldn't call them mean those guys have always been amazing to me but I have seen other artists. I've seen other bands that open shows for them. Uh, I won't name anybody, but I've come across other famous people who were complete raging assholes. Um, so to work with Tech and Surge, they could not have been any sweeter. To, two of the two of them were like teddy bears, man, and just awesome to work with. And that's, you know, it's uh, you have to sort of consider yourself because I, I have a buddy. My buddy was a music video director and he was talking about working with a specific artist who doesn't have a great public image. And he was just saying that the dude is a nightmare. So, yeah, you can get all kinds for sure. And, and that's always a bummer, man. Like the whole adage of never meet your heroes. You know what I mean? And then like, obviously, you know, Aerosmith, one of the biggest bands of all time. And, you know, for people our age, you know, like tech, so like you said, System of a Down, I grew up a huge punk rock kid, man. But yeah. when Toxicity came out, I knew every word to every song on that. I mean, you could put on the prison song right now and dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go right with it. Because their albums are incredible front to back. That's, you know, the same thing, that's like the same thing when um, when Bruce first came to set, because I have a, my friend Craig was the showrunner on Ash vs. Evil Dead. And, and I had heard some weird rumor before i think it was right before we cast bruce that he was really difficult to work with and uh i was like i should just text craig why am i worrying about these rumors and i texted craig and craig was like dude he's the greatest person ever and talk about meeting your heroes when we were on set i mean even devin devin has just he came off a of hunter hunter which was a really big indie film uh, he had done Escape Plan with Stallone and Bautista, and like he's having this huge career resurgence. And I think he was in the middle of doing Chucky, or he was going to do Chucky, and even he was in awe of Bruce Campbell. And it's like you worry maybe Bruce Campbell's going to be a dick. And it's like, dude, he was the greatest. He was the greatest, you know. So, well, and that's the perfect segue, man. Because I was going to say, not only have you directed these music videos, but uh, films like Happy Birthday and the criminally, and I mean criminally underrated black friday you're talking about <laughs> underrated bands i know you guys can't really see this because of my background i genuinely love this movie and in the sledge household this is a staple now on thanksgiving so why is it uh, why is it criminally underrated I, I don't where have you been I, seeing that what i'm saying the reason i'm saying that this is criminally underrated because if you talk to an average non-horror fan they've sure. probably never heard of this movie oh well for sure i mean it's an in, it's a small indie i mean bruce is a right. big name devin's a big name but it's like Unless you have, uh, you know, everyone's like, oh, Barbarian was huge and, and Smile was huge. And it's like, well, yeah, they spent $30 million on, on advertising. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it is it is what it is. You know, we're, we're ha we had a huge uh, resurgence this past Thanksgiving weekend in the U.S. over the Black Friday holiday of just the social media talk and just people... Yeah. Um, the guy from, it's so funny, the guy from Dead Meat did a review and he shit on the movie a little bit, but then he sort of came back, at, he came around at the end, sort of like liking it a little bit. And somebody was like, I, 
I was like, oh, I love this guy. I love my kids love his channel. And someone was like, why, why would you support him? He didn't like your movie. I was like, I don't care. Like he he reviewed it and millions of people saw that. And the movie was getting millions of millions of views. Right. And it's like, who cares? You know? Well, the best thing about James is he's just a genuine guy. You know, he's a Michigan guy like me. I've known James and Chelsea for a long time. And um, they're not going to pussyfoot around when it comes to their review on something. And um, but I think he said it best, too. Like, you know, this movie, to me, it is that blend of horror and it is that blend of comedy where, to me, I appreciate a lot of the comedy in this movie. Like the Seth Green cameo as the teddy bear. I think that's just phenomenal. You know, like so some funny. of the lines he's saying. Yeah. Um, I love – and. If you guys haven't seen it, I can't recommend uh, Dead Meat, uh, his review, his kill count on Black Friday. Um, he goes in depth about how some of the working conditions you guys had with COVID and how you could only have, was it, five extras on set at a time. It was brutal. And, and for you guys to be able to show a Black Friday type atmosphere with only five people at a time yeah. had to be extremely difficult. So impossible. what was it like to do something like that for you? It's impossible. It's impossible. I mean, it was like... Uh... I could almost compare it to like trying to make a movie in like, you know, 1940s Russia or something. It was just <laughs> impossible. Um, you know, if we were making a small little indie, uh, I'm trying to do another one with Devin now, and it's a, a very dark character drama that it's about a couple of brothers and they get into some situations. And it's like, you could shoot that movie during COVID because you don't need a ton of extras, but a movie like this, it takes place in a toy store on the busiest shopping night of the year. Like we have that one scene and it's okay, but it's not, obviously you have a wish list of things that you want to do. Um, and the extras was, you know, there's that one scene where the, my buddy Mike Murphy is pushing like a block down the aisle and Ryan Lee tips over the ball thing. Like you mm -hmm. want to see like 50 people scurrying around yeah. him, but dude, we, we just couldn't do it. So it is what it is. I think at the end of the day, you know, Andy got the movie that he wanted, which was a movie about how shitty it is to work in retail, because from what <laughs> I've seen, at least, you know, when the movie first came out, we had a lot of people like, fuck this movie. It sucks. Bruce, you know, Bruce is playing such a, a wimp and it's this is an evil dead. And it's like, but now it seems like the the chatter around the movie has come the other way, because even when James did his review his tweet got retweeted a bunch of times and there was a lot of comments. And I, I swear, and I'm not saying this because when the movie first came out, it was like split. Half the audience loved it, half the audience didn't. But I noticed on James, James's tweet, I would say it was about 90% positive and 10% negative. There was a couple people that were like, this movie sucked. And it's like, dude, I, there's plenty of movies that I think suck. So I, you know, say whatever you want, you know? Right. Um, well, and that's but, the biggest thing. Like if you can start to take criticism like that, then you're, you're, you know, like, nobody's made something for everybody. There's even people out there that hate the Beatles white album. I mean, that shit happens. I, I personally am not a huge Beatles fan. So <laughs> I get it. Well, see, I, I was wrong one time in the nineties too, my friend. So I can understand where you're coming from. Um, another thing. I mean, we, we we also, we're, also, little... we're also living in an era where it's like online fandom and toxic fandom. And like <laughs> people, people were mad that we killed Michael Jai white. So early in the movie and it's like, okay. in the logistics of making a film, we had the movie cast and we had this one role left and it was like the financiers were like, who can we get to help the, the sort of scope of the movie? And Michael, Ivana and Devin uh, were all at the Gersh agency and someone was like, well, what about Michael Jai White? And I was like, would he do it? So we sent him the script and he was like, yeah, he, and he came to Boston for like, I don't know, five days or something. So it's like when you only have somebody for a certain period of time, right. it's like if you see an indie with um, John Travolta or Mel Gibson, and they're in like three scenes. It's because those guys are getting paid to show up for like two days. You know, right. so you, you, people don't realize the logistics of um, how movies get made and how difficult it is in regards to like the cost of certain actors and how long they can be there. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I have a tendency to ramble. Sorry. No, you're fine, man. But what I was going to say, like, you kind of went into right what I was going to talk about. Like, you have your Michael Jai White, you have Bruce Campbell, you have Devin Sawa. For being an indie film, you have a cast of people that is fucking amazing. Yep. And, like, that's a feather in the cap right there because, yes. you know, obviously everybody, Devin Sawa is my guy. You know, like, he's the best. He's the best. <laughs> I'm the, I'm, I am a straight white man. I wouldn't be for him. Like, that's how much I love that guy. He's been, <laughs> a, you know, 
whether it was, like I said, I grew up a big punk rock kid, you know? So whether it was Salt Lake City punk, you know, or some of the horror stuff he did with like Final Destination and even the younger stuff he did, I've always been a huge fan. Well, and Devin, then, Devin is also, I think, is having sort of this, not not as big yet as John Travolta come back, but you have to look at like, look at a lot of the child actors that Devin worked with or around, you know, like mm -hmm. some of these child actors, you see like Corey Feldman, who's like, people sort of laugh at him or whatever. And he's in a band or something. And it's like, Devin just went and did two seasons of Chucky. He was on that show hacks, which is like the biggest comedy on TV. He did yeah. black Friday. He's doing some other work. And it's like, he's starting to build that, that sort of um, the Renaissance of people being like, dude, this guy's awesome because he's an incredible actor, which I think if he sucked, wouldn't be happening. You know what I mean? So I'm trying right. to do one of, I'm trying to do one of my next films. Where I literally wrote the lead for him because I think he's that good, you know? And and he is. Like, you, you were just talking about the different characters that he plays. You know, even that uh, Fred Durst movie that they did. Um, he was great with, with Travolta. Yeah. He was fantastic. Yeah. D that movie blew my mind, you know? And you talk about Chucky. You know, he played literally three completely different characters throughout his arc of two seasons and was yep. believable in every role. He's really in Black good. Friday every time black friday is over i'm like damn we need to go get some pancakes like right now we need to get in the van we need to go get some pancakes right now so um I i'm just yeah, really he, happy he was, for you man that he was great and it's funny you mentioned seth too like seth's been a friend of mine for a long time and and uh we the bear was like andy had we had written some lines uh but we didn't know how, how that was going to go were we going to use like a robot voice or whatever and i called seth and i was like okay would you do this thing like this robot that's malfunctioning this bear and he was like well he's like well what's like what's the backstory and we started talking and we came up with this hilarious thing of like any of these talking toys yeah. like somebody's in a sound booth somewhere reading pages of dialogue <laughs> and we were like what if the guy just had the worst day of his life like drunk in the left, booth his wife left him and like <laughs> And uh, he had a page of dialogue, but but when the sound recording was clicking, it was every time the microphone wasn't on, he was being recorded. And it was like, awesome. I fucking hate this. Like, my fucking wife just left me. And, dude, he and I were dying laughing. And I, I was texting Andy live, and I'm like, dude, you, you wouldn't believe the shit he's coming up with. And it's uh, a lot of people love that that little character, so... Yeah. And I, you talked about how you have another project coming up that you're working on. I'm very excited to see that when it comes into fruition. And the best part is you guys don't have to wait for me to update you on this because I have all of Casey's social media links down here in the description. So make sure you're clicking these social media links, make sure you're giving him a follow so you can stay up to date on everything that he has coming up here in the future. Because if you haven't already, guys, I can't recommend this movie enough. Black Friday, um, fantastic movie, a lot of fun. And like you said, I love the fact that we have Bruce Campbell playing something that's not groovy, baby. You know, like he's not your Ash, your Bubba Ho tap. You know, that's not who he is in this film. And it is something that looks like it's outside of his comfort zone. We do get a good character arc with him on becoming a hero. We do get some good twists in Black Friday. I'm not going to go spoiler here because I think you guys should check it out. But um, not only monsters bite, I'll tell you that much. So um, that, in, changed, in order that, that changed too, because Bruce's arc was originally just terror. He was just a terrible person. And I said to Andy, like, I think like a week or two before we shot. And I was like, man, we have, we got Bruce Campbell. Like we, we should do him some justice. And Andy was yeah. like, yeah, whatever, whatever works. And Bruce actually, Andy and I would write, rewrite stuff and send it to Bruce and he would like approve it. And uh, it, it became a real collaborative thing as far as what was going to happen with Jonathan's character, you know, cause I wanted people to like him at the, at the end, you know, because he's, right. not, he's not truly the villain. He's just a guy that could stop working in retail, you know? And, and, and that's all he has. Yep. You know, like, and he makes that abundantly clear. Like, I, I, this is me. This is who I am. And I have people that have to like me. They have to listen to me. And we've all felt like that at times. And you have that, you know, you're alone, you know, and this is his way of getting out there. So the characters are well written. And if you have a guy like Bruce Campbell, like you said, you guys are going back and forth with him and you're letting him have that creative, you know, discussion, I think he's going to work harder for you because he knows that you trust his judgment and yeah. he's going to give you a hundred percent every time. And that's, that's fucking cool, man, that you guys were able to do that with him. Yeah. It's also, I think you have to look at like, you know, it's it, it, the, the final product is, is uh, I know Andy loves the movie and he's proud of it, but it's, it's much different than what his initial intention was. But that, I think that's a good indicator for anybody out there who's a screenwriter like if you write a script 
you look at like um inglorious bastards and once upon a time in america are two of my favorite movies and i i also love true romance but a completely different movie because tony scott directed it you know um so I think there's a version of Andy's movie that is much darker, much campier, but that's not the movie that I wanted to make. So it became a little bit more kind of mainstream, a little bit of heart, you know what I mean? So it just goes to show you like the process of it all, even in the editing, you know, it changes, mm -hmm. things can change daily. You know, you can, right. there's a big piece of the story that our producer Warner was like, I think this works better if you move it here. And it, it made way more sense to the overall project. So from, from start to finish, a lot of things happen, you know. And, and that's, again, why I'm saying, like, when you have that collaborative it, with everybody there, it can make a product that was good become great. You know, yeah. if you, you got, but like you said, you have to have a screenwriter and a director that's open to other people's opinions. You know, you yeah. can't have, you know, uh, you know, a communist movie where it's, this is my way and this is how it's going to happen and that's it. You know, when you guys have that camaraderie between all of you, I think that's a special thing. Yeah, I agree. So in order for you, though, to direct horror movies, Casey, horror has to start for you somewhere. So here mm. for a minute, my friend. Well, we're not talking about Black Friday anymore, so I'm going to take this Christmas hat off here for a little bit. Um, <laughs> in, honor of, we, in honor of Devin. Right. Uh, we are going to go back to the past here for a second, my friend, and talk about what got you started in horror, the first horror movie that you watched, and Casey, your first horror movie was... Um, I, I think I had said to you initially it was Poltergeist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that one is chock full of like shit your pants moments, you know, between the chairs being moved and the chicken wing in the mirror and the, and the clown and the tree. It, you know, here's the funny thing is my kids now are 14, 12 and nine, but I would say four or five years ago, my middle son went through a he's still major horror phase. He was watching everything. And we watch Poltergeist and it's PG. Yeah. So is Jaws. Yeah. So I think, you know, I also, I grew up in the woods in Massachusetts. So, so there wasn't a lot of like, Hey, let's go down to the cinema. I mean, we would do that occasionally. We would go see all the tent poles like Predator, Indiana Jones, but yeah. we weren't seeing like, you know, I know like Joe Lynch grew up in Long Island. I think he had more access to, we had a video store, but it was all B movies, you know, things like extra, um and chud uh <laughs> just all these amazing 80s b movies and i it's funny i had somebody approach me recently to do a a sequel to a very obscure 80s b movie and i was like oh dude i would be all over that because you just didn't have have access to all that stuff so so poltergeist was definitely the first um but i think if you go and you look at like the list of 80s horror whatever we could get at the video store um you know for me was it's the entire list you know the entire list of all of yeah. them all of, all the big ones i was so lucky man i grew up uh, my parents owned a video store downtown video we had our own little mom and pop video store so my job every week was to make sure that the vcr tapes that came back into vhs's got put in the vcr rewinder and rewound and then at the end of the week, I got to rent one movie and one Nintendo Nintendo cartridge. So oh, nice. I definitely know what you're talking about when it comes to yeah, being I, in the video I also, store. I also remember, uh, I think it was like eight, 1982 or 83. But maybe it was, I don't, huh, it was like a year after a movie came out that ended up on VHS. So my buddy Neil, who does, he does all my tattoos. I remember walking by him in the hallway and he was like, did you see the thing? And I was like, no, not yet. And he was like, man, I think we were in sixth grade, maybe. Yeah. So I, I was 10 or 11. And he goes, did you see the thing? And I was like, no. And he's like, oh, man, the dog's face splits open. And I, I'll never forget that moment of him telling me that. And then I saw it. And that movie, I mean, God, everybody loves that movie, you know. Yeah. But just goes to show you that movie. It's funny. That movie was kind of a bomb when it came out, mm. you know. Um, Dude, and it's funny because it was considered a terrible remake when it came out yeah, you know yeah. hilarious a lot, of people, <laughs> a lot of people don't know that it's a remake um right so you know there was that and there was uh a lot of the like slumber party massacre and halloween three and whatever you could get your hands on um at that time for like whatever the vhs store had you know what i mean yeah cujo that there was a big stephen king there run in the early mid mid 80s like cujo christine um i remember um the 
the knife, the guy sticking the knife in the yogurt in Christine in Christina. My brothers and I always just thought that was the funniest fucking thing we'd ever seen. <laughs> so um I also used to have um this weird box top before cable. We had this weird box top thing. It was called Preview. It was owned by like Comcast before it was Comcast or something. And we would get all the B movies like Dead Zone or you know psycho two or whatever and and uh, not like the hollywood blockbusters but the fringe movies for sure you want to talk about one of the greatest sequels of all time i could do a whole episode on psycho two and how that's one of the most uh, fucking movies so good man oh yeah underrated probably yeah absolutely it's in my top 10 sequels of all time but that's awesome um oh yeah and, and like i said poltergeist huge movie for me growing up as well you know, I got Carol Ann here on my shirt. You can barely see her because of the skull. But yeah, um, do you remember about how old you were the first time you had seen Poltergeist? I mean, if it, I think it came out in 82, so I would have been eight. Uh, so maybe you're looking at came out on VHS a year or two later. So I was probably 10. I mean, all those movies like between 10 and between nine and like 12, nine and 11 or 12. And that's one of the things Janice said was. He goes, you know, I read an interview with Casey and he said he wanted to make this movie for 13 year olds. And if I was a 13 year old and I was at a sleepover, I'd love this movie. And like, that's literally the movie I was trying to make. It's like all those movies I watched when I was a yeah. kid, like Children of the Corn and Gremlins and Nightmare on Elm Street is like, you know, I, I see some of the, you know, horrors come a long way because you see a movie like um, Hereditary or something and that will just fucking scare the shit out of you no matter how old you are. But I think when, yeah. you're, when you're an adult and you see things like, you know, gremlins, you're like, okay, come on. It's kind of funny and hokey. And I, Black Friday, I wanted it to be that, you know. Middle ground. Yeah, eight to like 14-year-old sleepover movie, you know. That right. was my goal, 100%. And, and it's funny because like, and you mentioned like, even like with Poltergeist, like I, I look at Poltergeist as a movie kind of like I do The Exorcist where – as a young child, I'm watching this movie and I look at it through a completely different scope than I do as a parent. You know, like this movie scared me as a child because of what's happening to Carol Ann. And then as a parent, it scares me because of what's happening to Carol Ann, but for two completely different reasons. And, yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot of a very, and especially like you said, Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg, PG horror movie. You know, it's going to be knocked out of the park, but it's going to be timid enough for the kids to watch too. So do you remember which scene it was from Poltergeist that affected you the most? Definitely the chicken wing in the mirror. I mean, the maggot. I mean, I think for me, at least me personally, I I, uh, I was always more scared of things that seemed potentially seemed real. You know, yeah. the, the I, had, I had a tweet that went viral. It was retweeted like 4,000 times or something. It, it was blowing on my Twitter for like two weeks. I put a tweet out about, what's the scare the first frame of any movie that scared you the most and mine was when freddie had his arms like stretched out in the alleyway um but i think for me at least personally with cinema and what scares me is i was always more scared of things that seem sort of real you know mm -hmm. like the shining i always thought was terrifying because the guy's locked in a place and he's losing his mind um so i think when i saw that poltergeist clip and the special effects were just so incredible. I mean, it straight up looked like the dude was just ripping his face off. And I, that's, I don't know. I mean, to me, that's probably a defining moment for sure, you know. Oh, and it's funny because what people don't remember is back then, you know, me personally, I had four TV channels, 11, 13, 24, 36. Like, that's all I had. And when you had these movies like Poltergeist and another big one for me that I remember that's PG was Tourist Trap. Mm. and i remember seeing these movies at like one o'clock in the afternoon on tv and being fucking scared man yeah. like totally yeah. terrified yeah and this movie is one of the ones that um for all its effective scenery it really comes together as one cohesive unit at the end with a big wraparound of everything that happens in the house um what would you say your favorite scene from poltergeist is um that's a good question Probably the chair scene, because just in terms of just straight up filmmaking, to, to be able yeah. to fucking jump, the whole audience jump when that mom, uh, Joe Beth Williams, is like doing something, 
sees the chair, turns around, comes back, and it's they're all it's just like whoa, yeah. No, and there's the, no cut there. No, there's no visual cut. You know, I've gone no. from one scene to the other. It's, it's it yeah. looks like an unbroken shot right there. I, I think it is. I don't know how they did it, but the magic of that is probably like you know that's the most mind blowing yeah. thing. I I think, and you know, and don't forget. Um, there's so many other things like the clown. I was never really scared of clowns. I know that's a big one for people. Um, but that's why I never like jived with the it movies. I always thought uh, Tim Curry's like creepy pedophile Pennywise was 10 times scarier than the current Pennywise. You know what I mean? Um, Cause that seemed to be something more realistic. Movie. Yeah, exactly. The, the new like if I seen, I, I've said that if I seen Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise out in the street, I'd, even at 36, I'd run the other fucking way. Yeah, but Pennywise is it doesn't look scary. He looks right. like that John Wayne Gacy, like that sweetheart, kind, sweet clown that just wants to you know, make yeah. you laugh and give you a balloon and he bites your fucking arm off. Yeah, that was to me the Tim Curry one was always hilarious because he's like he's got that Long Island kind of he's like smoking <laughs> cigarettes. Like, like, you know, that's creepy. That's like that's the guy that wants to keep you in his basement. You know. Right, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that someone else feels that way. I, I don't mind Skarsgård's portrayal of the character. I think he did a great job, but I just he's scary from the rip. You know, to it's me, a he's a different just kind of movie. Idea. I think yeah. it's. I think those Stephen King books are up to interpretation. I think you could, you could do those a million different ways. I know that um, Stephen King loves the remake of The Shining with uh, what's his name from Wings. Yeah. Um, Brian, the, uh, the made for TV one. Yeah, he loves that version. Um, so I mean, you give. 10 different directors, 10 different versions of, you know, Cujo uh, mm-hmm. or Christine, you're going to get different movies, you know, which and, is and that's it. And I agree with you. I think that's awesome. Like you said, it's, uh, different directors are going to have different visions and that's what you get out of them. Yeah. Um, and speaking of directors, you know, as of right now, you know, remakes, requels, sequels, that's kind of all the rage right now. That's, all, that's, guys- all, that's all that it is, there is really. Yeah, they, they did get the remake treatment. I believe it was 2015, 2014, and nobody, maybe. And nobody cared. <laughs> did, did you watch it? I think I tried to. I, you know, my kids are huge movie nuts, so they'll always be like, hey, we watch this, we watch this. And I, I just, you have to be careful. You know, I think that when you're treading in the water of something that's as classic as that, you know, it's like you want to remake Firestarter. Okay, Firestarter wasn't a huge movie, but Poltergeist is like, the fabric of our culture and the same thing with ghostbusters yeah. you know paul feig is one of the greatest directors out there and he's got four arguably the four funniest women in movies and you read you ghostbusters like wh- there's got to be an amazing script out there about four women who are monster hunters or something like don't try to fucking remake ghostbusters like i, I just right I just don't really jive with that. It's like, I think Zemeckis has a clause in his contract. You can't remake Back to the Future until he's dead or something. Um, yeah. Like, I remember reading Thank recently, I think, I think that Disney Plus remade Home Alone. It's like, why? Why? Like, do you really think it's going to make that much money? I, I, because I don't, I don't think it's going to, you know? Look at what, the, look, I mean, look at what Terrifier 2 just did. You know, mm-hmm. indie horror you know, smile, like you were talking about earlier. Like, these movies are blowing away all the remakes or reruns that we're getting. Because, because they're are... original movies. Because as yes. human beings, we crave stories and originality. And it's yes. just, like, it, it blows my mind. And all, you know, all due respect um, to everybody that works at Marvel and DC. And I know Tarantino got in trouble because he said that those guys aren't movie stars or whatever. I just, you know, if you ever seen... Um, Nightcrawler and or Michael Clayton, the Gilroy brothers, I think worked on both of those. There may be two of the best movies in modern cinema. Nightcrawler should have won Best Picture. And Michael Clayton probably should have too. So of all my friends and all my buddies that are producers have been like begging me to watch Andor, watch Andor, watch Andor. So I took my flight from Boston to LA is six hours or whatever. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to watch it all. And I, I got through like three episodes and I was like, man, I, I just don't, it's enough with Star Wars for me. You know, like, I right. don't care. I don't care. The acting is incredible. The story is incredible. But for me, it's just gotten to a point with Marvel and Star Wars and all the Marvel TV shows that it's so, there's so much content that I, I just don't give a shit. You know what I mean? It's overwhelmed. You 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 miss one thing and you're you're out on all of it. You're missing so many different. Yeah, I, I get it. I completely get it. And it's not and a slight. I, to, it's not a slight to anybody. If James Gunn called me and said, "Hey, we want you to make a Space Ghost movie," I would, of course, I would do it. But but right. but I just 
it's just gotten to a point where it's like, man, you look at all the um, the TV shows that people love, whether it's like Breaking Bad or people now love this Yellow Jackets or uh, people love House of Dragon and Game of Thrones. Like th that's all newer intellectual property. It's all because people crave that stuff. You know, the yeah. Matrix was the biggest movie ever because that's a world nobody had ever seen before. So mm -hmm. I feel like this whole like, Man, I don't know. It's just not good. It's not good for anybody when you're constantly like remaking Carrie and Firestarter and they're redoing Friday. They're doing a TV show about Friday the 13th, which is, I think, just a complete ripoff of what they're doing with Chucky. It's like yeah. Mancini's done such an incredible job with that series. Somebody was like, hey, let's just take Crystal Lake and we'll do the same thing. And it's like, dude, that's so lame. It's so lame. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about it because. I, I would like to see a prequel. I just think it all comes down to me is who's going to play Mrs. Voorhees. That's what's going to seal the deal for me. I'm sure it'll be great. My point is, my, my point more is, is it's just such a lazy way for right. uh, executives to go, let's just take this and do an offshoot. Yep. You know, it's like I saw, um, there was like a fucking show about Alfred the Butler or something. I'm like, who the fuck cares about Alfred the Butler? <laughs> like, seriously? Bruce didn't care. I mean, just so <laughs> stupid, you know? Hopefully, right. James, hopefully James Gunn and Peter Safran will, like, wipe the DC slate clean and just start over, you know? We could only hope. Because yeah. I, I think, as a kid, I liked DC more than Marvel anyway. It was always darker. I um, always loved all I, – I still love all the animated stuff that they do, you know? Yeah. I think it's, it's difficult. Good. It's difficult for some of that to translate to screen, but we'll see. I mean, if anyone can do it, he can. Right. Well, I mean – Another thing I wanted to ask you, because we've talked about your first movie, horror movie being Poltergeist and what that means to you. But, Casey, my little buddy Ghostface is here, and he has a question for you. What's your favorite scary movie, Casey? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Probably, it's that's a two a two-headed beast, I think. My favorite horror movie of all <laughs> I mean, it's tough. You have to sort of go with, like, Alien or The Shining. Um, and I think my favorite modern horror movie is Hereditary. Um, so we'll go like Young Me, Old Me. Old Me is definitely Hereditary. Young Me is probably The Shining. Um, when Tony Collette is just a fucking monster, man. And that whole movie is just so oh, that guy's fucking brain is like Hieronymus Bosch, like a dolly painting on acid. It's just so deep and layered and textured and fucking scary so you know uh, that yeah I'm, I'm with you hereditary is one of those movies that after the movie was done i was extremely unsettled like just sitting there like wow the, I, was the watching emotion. That, I was watching that movie i think my uh my ex-wife had my kids at her mom's or something and i watched that movie by myself and like halfway through the power went out in my house like just out and i was like oh man like it was fucking yeah. scary yeah yeah, so. we, we were we were lucky enough to see it in cinema on opening night, but we were also unlucky enough to because you had a bunch of dickheads in the theater. They kept going. Oh, God. It's like, oh, dude, God. shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, I hate brutal. you. <laughs> yeah, we went to see Barbarian in the theater. It was such a great experience because so many people were like, what the fuck is going on here? Just such a great – We remember, I remember walking out of the theater and my son and I were laughing hysterically and some girl looked at us and she goes, what, what did we just watch? And I was like, isn't that the best part of it, you know? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anybody that said they kind of had an idea about going into Barbarian unless they were spoiled by somebody is full of shit. That trailer didn't give you nothing. No. You know? No. All I knew is it had Justin Long, Phil Skarsgård, and it took place in Detroit. That's all I knew. I was like, I'm yeah. in. You, yeah. And I couldn't, for like weeks, I thought about Justin Long's character and how much I hated him. Like, I thought about it for weeks. Like, that's the type of guy that I want. I meet and I just want to punch in the fucking face, man. Yeah. Like, I couldn't stand that guy. That's funny. Um, yeah, well, Casey, again, I want to thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with me for a little bit. Now, as always, before I let you go, I always end this with the same question. We're going to bounce back to Poltergeist. And what we're going to do is rank this movie on a skull count. Now, we're not judging Poltergeist on acting, production, score, direction, nothing like that. What we're doing here is strictly ranking this movie on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So, zero skulls being not effective. Five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, Casey, what would your ranking of the OG Poltergeist be? 
You said the top was five? Yep. Oh, fucking seven. <laughs> <laughs> I figure, man, because especially when you're a young kid and you're watching something like this, like you see a tree coming in a house and taking a little boy, you know, and you look at a swimming pool full of skeletons that are popping I mean, just up everywhere. Incredible. Incredible. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I give and it a five. I, a five. And it's 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 amazing, man. I, I still think to this day this movie is amazing. Um, unfortunate what happened to Heather O'Rourke. I think she could have been a fucking burning star in Hollywood, man. A young lady that obviously medical misdiagnosis took her life a little too soon. But uh, a movie that I still watch at least once a year to this day. So um, I do want to remind everybody because we are at the end of the third act. The credits are about to roll. The curtain's about to drop. But all of Casey's social media links are down here in the description, guys. So make sure you're clicking those and giving him a follow. Uh, Casey, please don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. No, I, no, I'm good. Everybody else, as always, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.